just before I get started, I did want to thank you, Oliver, um, not only for the invitation today, but also just for your work uh, leading the Centre for Trust Studies, because I think it's just a, such a fantastic forum for us um, to come together as an international trust community and also to help us, of course, to share our research. Um, so before I get started today, um, I'd really like to... Um, Essentially what I'm doing today is taking the opportunity to share insights from a program of funded research that we conducted examining trust and trust violations in nonprofits. And I wanted to start by acknowledging um, my really wonderful collaborators on this project. So Matthew Hornsey and Cass Chapman, who are both at the University of Queensland. Um, Cass was actually the postdoc um, researcher working on this funded program of research with us. Um, she did a lot of the detailed research. But we also had some other fantastic colleagues join individual papers and projects that I'll go through today. Um, Karen Healy, who brought a wealth of experience um, working in nonprofits, um, and she comes from a social work background and has been on the boards of many nonprofits. Um, also, Steve Lockie, Mattia Anisa, and Morgana Lizio Wilson, and two uh, honor students at the time, Heidi Mangan and Stephen Lamaccio. Okay, so why do we want to study trust in nonprofits? Well, the motivation here really came from um, an observation that nonprofits have a unique relationship with trust. So, nonprofits serve a really vital function in society. Um, their core mission is often um, to help the most vulnerable in society um, and to protect the well being of those who are very vulnerable. So to achieve this mission, they trade on their trusted reputation, so their image as purveyors of good. And it's from this reservoir of trust and goodwill that it fuels donations, volunteers, and community engagement. So for nonprofits, integrity and maintaining high moral standards is a really defining expectation. As you can think of it as a non-negotiable resource. So as such, trust breaches and the reputational damage that they cause present an existential threat to the survival of nonprofits. It can have catastrophic impacts on the ability to deliver to clients, um, on funding, on levels of donor and volunteer commitment. And this is exactly what we were witnessing at the time that we um, started working on this grant. So there had been the international sex scandal at Oxfam that had led to mass withdrawals of donors. Um, and in Australia, as well as in other parts of the world, there were a range of high profile investigations and inquiries into misconduct and exploitation in nonprofits. Um, for example, many of these were involved wide scale mistreatment and abuse of you know, very vulnerable people, such as um, abuse of children, um, abuse of, and neglect of elderly in aged care and in disability services. We also observed in the literature that there were reports of increasing incidents of trust and ethical violations in nonprofits. So we became really curious as to whether the nonprofit sector may have unique vulnerabilities and pressures that make them susceptible to trust violations and may also make trust recovery more difficult. So we were really motivated um, by a desire to want to provide practical evidence-based insights to support nonprofits in both preventing, but also addressing and recovering from trust failures. So to advance understanding of trust, violations and repair in nonprofits, we addressed five research questions through this funded research. Our first question um, was really focused on whether there are features of the nonprofit sector which contribute to trust violations. And if so, how do they have that impact? So here we used a qualitative theory building approach to explore it. And I'm going to actually focus on that um, question and that study, um, deep diving into that today. Another question that we looked at was whether people respond differently to violations by nonprofits and commercial organisations. And relatedly, after a transgression, do people respond differently to apologies when they come from nonprofits compared to for profit organisations? So here we used a series of experimental studies. And um, the fourth question there, we, we wanted to understand if we were actually witnessing a global crisis of trust in nonprofits, as the media was certainly portraying at the time. So we examined how trust levels in nonprofits had changed over time using a longitudinal multi-country design. And finally, we sought to understand how much trust matters for charitable giving by conducting a meta-analysis. So in the presentation today, I'm going to deep dive on that first question um, and the study associated with that, and then I'll present key findings or takeaways um, related to the other questions. So this paper um, that addresses the question of whether there are features of nonprofits that contribute to trust violations, um, we published this earlier this year, just a couple of months ago in the Journal of Business Ethics. 
Okay, so the motivation for this study came certainly from the desire to understand whether the causes of trust violations in nonprofits um, are impacted uh, by features at the sector level. But we also, um, um, the motivation came from this broader observation that trust violations seem to thrive and proliferate in particular industry sectors. So for example, we've seen global scandals and trust failures in banking and finance, in sport, in the media, in the entertainment industry, um, as well as in aged care institutions that are for-profit and government run, as well as non-profit. So while membership of certain industry sectors has been shown to increase the likelihood that an organization will engage in illegal activity, there's limited research that was, that's examining how institutional or industry level factors influence individual level trustworthy conduct and uh, engagement in violations. So if we have a look at the reviews and meta-analyses of this literature, it demonstrates that work has almost exclusively focused on the individual group and organisational contributors to violations without consideration of the broader institutional factors. So there appears to be an implicit assumption in the literature that the causes of trust violations um, occur within the boundaries of the organisation and not beyond. But we did see some emerging work that suggests sector and industry conditions can contribute. Um, so work in the nonprofit sector look, um, indicates that competitive pressure, rapid industry growth and resource scarcity or abundance can contribute to um, illegal conduct. So we wanted to respond to um, multiple calls that we saw in the literature um, to examine the interplay between institutional level features with organisational and individual contributors to violations. So one of the concepts that we were working with here was the concept of ethical infrastructure. And that can be defined, as you can see here, by organisational elements that contribute to ethical effectiveness. So formal systems such as monitoring systems, sanctions, rewards, ethics codes, but also informal systems like ethical climate and culture. And this concept is similar to um, one in the trust literature where we talk about trustworthy organisational infrastructure or designing trustworthy organisations. So there's some evidence in the literature to suggest that nonprofits may have a unique ethical infrastructure. Um, for example, some prior work suggests that nonprofits often have weaker governance, uh, weaker regulatory structures, or weaker internal controls. And there's also some evidence in terms of ethical climate that nonprofit leaders tend to create cultures that are, that are more socially responsible and benevolent. So our key question here was really looking at whether features of the nonprofit sector influence trust violations, and if so, how? So we conducted an inductive qualitative field study, drawing on in-depth interviews with Australian nonprofit board members and senior executives. And we specifically sought these senior, senior leaders that had cross-sectoral experience. So they had experience in the nonprofit sector, but also experience in either the for-profit or the government sector. And we felt that this was important to provide the ability to identify whether there may be potential sector-specific influences that contributed to trust violations in nonprofits. Now, each of these senior figures um, had played a central role in responding to and managing trust violations in um, a range of different organizations. And we used a critical incident approach, asking them about the nature and causes of the trust violations in their organizations, as well as how they managed um, these and any strategies that were put in place to prevent violations. We also asked whether they, view, in their experience, whether they thought nonprofits were more, less, or equally vulnerable to trust violations, and if so, how and why. So collectively, our interviewees reported 70 incidents of trust violations, and these range from fraud and resource misuse to abuse of clients and service failures. And we analyze these leaders' perspectives to inductively draw out themes. And specifically, we identified 10 factors that were consistently viewed as contributing to trust violations. And from the data, we interrogated their interrelationships to generate a conceptual model. And then we presented um, and discussed that model back with a sample of our interviewees, what we call a member check process, to ensure that it aligned with their experience. So here's our conceptual model. Uh, don't be too scared, I'll walk you through it. Um, so the first thing that I'll note here is that 82% of people um, that we interviewed perceive nonprofits as more vulnerable to violations um, than for-profit and government organizations. And our multi-level model provides some insights on how and why this greater vulnerability occurs. 
So specifically, we identified three features of the nonprofit sector, um, increasing corporatization, resource scarcity, and assumed moral integrity. So what we can see here at the top of the model. And these three features trickle down to influence the ethical infrastructure of the organization. So the four boxes in light blue in the middle. And what we found was that these in turn then influence individual level employee behaviors and orientations, which ultimately manifest as trust violations. So I'm gonna walk you through each of the pathways. So the first pathway was driven by this notion of corporatization. So interviewees described how nonprofits had become corporatized, meaning they had adopted organizational structures and processes, goals and rhetoric that mimic commercial organizations. So the focus within um, of this commercialization was organizational competitiveness through growth, revenue generation, efficiency, and service output. So you can see here one of our interviewees said, you know, you've got nonprofits that are actually operating more like commercial operations. Now, this is not unique to Australia. A systematic review of almost 600 samples concluded that the process of nonprofits becoming more businesslike is a well-established global phenomenon. Now, this corporatization of the sector was largely attributed to a government retreat from social service provision, and that increased the need for nonprofits to take on and deliver large government service contracts. And corporatization was perceived as necessary and inevitable in order for these nonprofits to survive because they needed to have scale and they needed to meet these very prescriptive service contracts from the government in order to be able to gain ongoing funding. So um, corporatization was also in part a consequence of a greater demand from funders for accountability and transparent reporting on how funds were being spent. Now, at the organisational level, this corporatization resulted in a displaced organisational mission. So participants described how their non-profit organisations had lost sight of their fundamental mission over time um, as they prioritise that revenue, that efficient service output and delivering on those um, contractual service obligations. So this crowded out the organisation's core mission. And it was also seen to, what was also exacerbating this was more and more um, board and senior leadership positions being filled by people from the private sector who bought this business acumen, um, but not necessarily a deep understanding of the organization's mission. And often these leaders put in place narrow or restrictive performance metrics, um, such as measuring the number of clients served and how many hours of service was being delivered rather than um, other indicators of the quality of the service. Now, at the individual level, this mission displacement manifested in employees and volunteers taking a more commercial orientation to their work, um, prioritising the number of clients served rather than the quality. Um, and this facilitated trust violations um, such as substandard service and violations of clients' rights. So as one interviewee described, the error occurred because of this pressure for growth, this more clients needing to be serviced, the pressure of trying to build the organisation up more and more. So resource scarcity was another feature of the nonprofit sector that contributed to trust violations. So participants characterised the sector here as perpetually underfunded and under-resourced. So while some big players like Amnesty and Oxfam were immune from this, um, these nonprofits were not seen as representative of the broader sector. And again, this is not unique um, to our context. International research characterised the sector as having um, a climate of scarce resources with um, income streams that were often limited, that were unreliable or increasingly reliant on that government funding. So resource scarcity was in turn seen to contribute to trust violations. And this occurred through um, two pathways. Um, there's pathway A, um, which described how resource scarcity at the sector level meant that the organization actually had limited resources to remunerate employees, resulting in lower pay than other sectors, as well as a higher reliance on volunteers. So you can see here one participant you know, talked about the sector as being characterised by either meagre or less than award pay. Now, this resulted in nonprofits being unable to attract and retain well-rounded managers and employees. Often they had little choice but to hire well-meaning people, even if they didn't have all the required skill sets for the role. 
And at the individual level, this resulted in employees and volunteers often having limited capacity to perform their work, either in terms of having the right skills, knowledge, experience or training, or sometimes just not having enough time. And this contributed, again, to substandard performance, just not having the time to do their job right, um, as well as poor service quality or sometimes incompetent performance. For example, one nonprofit could not afford to pay, um, you know, employ someone with the skills and governance around risk management, um, which resulted in inadequate policies and procedures to detect and prevent abuse. And as this quote here highlights, um, there's often a tension with fitting nonprofit work around other paid work. So now limited um, remuneration and relying on volunteers also contributed to some employees and executives approaching their work with lax integrity. So often taking an unprofessional approach to their work and duties because they're not played. So one interviewee described how poorly remunerated board members who were busy with their paid work often took a lax approach to governance. Um, in one case, they talked about the chairman signing blank checks, which we all know is something that should never be done. Um, now that actually enabled um, a very significant fraud where the CEO embezzled over half a million dollars from the nonprofit. So I think as this example shows that limited capacity combined with the lax integrity often combined to enable those trust violations. Now, lax integrity was also evident in employees stealing or misusing the organization's resources to compensate themselves for their voluntary or low paid work. So this is a form of moral licensing where employees feel entitled to take from the organization because of all the volunteer work that they've provided. Now, pathway B here describes how resource scarcity resulted in looser um, control and accountability systems at the organizational level. So this often manifested as poor financial controls, um, as well as a lack of performance management systems. And this in turn created an environment that could easily be exploited by employees who had lax integrity, uh, which enabled often financial breaches to occur. So for example, an interviewee described how a serious incidence of fraud was caused by poor financial controls because the nonprofit just simply couldn't afford to put them in place. I hope everyone's with me so far. Okay, so the third pathway here assumed moral integrity. This was another feature which our interviewees identified as really contributing to trust violations. And this theme encapsulated two sector-wide assumptions. First, that people who work in nonprofits are inherently moral and trustworthy. And second, that they're motivated to work in the sector because of their commitment to the moral mission. So this strong belief that employees' moral mission is and should be the main reason for working in the sector, in turn justified and reinforced that um, no or limited pay, so the limited remuneration and reliance on volunteers. So as one um, interviewee states, you know, we don't compensate anyone. People do it purely for altruistic reasons. And another said, you know, if you're involved in a nonprofit, by the very nature of it, you shouldn't expect to be um, rewarded financially. So as what we've just discussed, low pay and volunteerism in turn contributed to that limited capacity and lax integrity at the individual level, which made the organisation vulnerable to trust violations. Now, assumed moral integrity um, also impacted trust violations through another pathway. And this essentially was that um, assumptions of moral integrity of those in the sector um, created a high trust culture. So it was very normative in these nonprofits to readily trust employees, volunteers, and really anyone who was associated with the organization. As one interviewee said, you know, of course, everyone's going to do the right thing if they're working in a nonprofit. So it was just this basic assumption. And also that you'd want that high trust to be reflected in the culture. So this high trust culture also manifested through this limited questioning of employees. And that further compounded the fact that organizations with highly trusted cultures were less inclined to implement controls and accountability systems that can help prevent um, an unethical conduct. So again, as an interviewee said, you know, often nonprofits um, don't have the processes to detect violations because your starting point assumption is that everyone's trying to do the right thing. So participants described many examples of how this um, trust structure blinkered employees from suspecting that others might abuse this trust and behave unethically. Um, one really pertinent example was at a nonprofit specialising in child sponsorship. Um, the director described how it was unthinkable that a child sponsor would use their role strategically to access and abuse children. 
describing it as something that we just never contemplated. Um, now, as child sponsors were implicitly trusted to do the right thing, the organisation at the time had no screening, no monitoring or oversight arrangements um, to protect children from abuse from sponsors, and that enabled and facilitated this abuse to go on for a long time undetected. So in some our data here, it suggests that um, respondents' internalisation and enactment of these sectoral beliefs about moral integrity in the sector um, and people's motivation that they were working in nonprofits for the right reason actually paradoxically created cultures and systems which facilitated um, opportunities for individuals to engage in um, unethical behaviour. Now, in terms of um, mechanisms to prevent trust violations in nonprofits, we found four overarching themes that captured both formal control and informal mechanisms. So people talked about the importance of board effectiveness, um, strong governance processes, robust, robust HR practices, and also embedding those cultural values. So these findings are really support prior work, suggesting that each of these elements is important um, as part of an organization's trustworthy or ethical infrastructure. But what we found really interesting here is that these preventative measures do not address the sectoral factors that our model um, suggested are actually the root causes of trust violations. All of them are firmly focused at the organisational level. So undoubtedly, these practices um, are important and can help prevent violations, but because they're not actually addressing any of the root causes at the sector level, um, the persistence of those sectoral causal roots um, is likely to weaken organisational efforts over time. So, for example, this may occur by both limiting an organisation's ability to effectively implement robust ethical infrastructure, the resource scarcity and those sectoral beliefs um, about the inappropriateness of remunerating people, for example, could undermine that. Okay, so we feel that our study makes three contributions to the trust literature. First, our findings suggest that the root causes of trust violations can be embedded in the institutional features of the sector or the industry. So we feel that we show how violations in organisations can be contextually embedded in and shaped by those broader field level institutions, and also the dynamic interplay that occurs between levels. So our model really challenges this pervasive implicit assumption um, within much of the trust and ethics literature that the causes of violations are occurring within the bounds of the organisation. And we feel that our um, work really supports the view of Sabina Siebert and colleagues in their 2015 organisational studies paper, where they say that we need to look beyond the factory gates, as in beyond the organisational boundary, in order to understand and tackle the systemic causes of trust violations in organisations. So drawing on um, Kish, Kish Gapart and colleagues well-known analogy um, of you know, bad apples and bad barrels, um, we feel that our study suggests that we need to not only examine the bad apples, so the individual characteristics, and not only the bad barrels as in the organizational characteristics, but we also need to understand what we call the bad fields, right? The sectoral or institutional characteristics that contribute to violations. Second, our findings really speak to the importance of rethinking the scope of ethical infrastructure. So currently this concept is firmly embedded at that organisational level. And I think our work highlights the need to extend that concept to the industry level, um, to examine and evaluate an industry's ethical infrastructure and how well an industry is designed to facilitate trustworthy, um, trustworthy behaviour and constrain unethical um, conduct. So by demonstrating that a sector or an industry can be considered an ethical infrastructure, um, we hope that we've provided here a conceptual basis to understand and account for that prevalence and spread of trust violations within industry sectors. Now, third, we contribute by advancing a multi-level understanding of the causes of trust violations in nonprofits and identifying which sectoral, organizational and individual level factors play a role and importantly, how they interrelate. Um, both within and across levels. So in doing this, um, we believe that we um, extend understanding of the unique ethical infrastructure of the nonprofit sector. Um, and we also contribute to quite a lot of um, smaller literatures, for example, the role of bottom line mentalities and performance pressure, the role of resource scarcity and remuneration in viol trust violations, as well as the role of um, trust cultures and moral licensing. Okay, so in terms of some of the practical implications, um, 
Well, we feel that our study highlights the practical need for sectoral, cultural and structural reforms um, that go beyond that organisational level. Um, and that that's often necessary to address those root causes of violations, um, both in nonprofits, but also in other industries where we're seeing those violations occurring across multiple organisations. Now, in relation to resource scarcity and focusing in specifically on nonprofits, um, given that most donors expect funds to be directed um, to frontline services, it often leaves nonprofits with very few resources to invest in governance mechanisms. And this is where we feel that perhaps professional associations, peak bodies um, and funders could work together to create resources and training that really support the sector to produce that robust ethical infrastructure. Our model also suggests that remuneration is intrinsically linked to ethical violations. So another approach here could be to introduce policies that support nonprofits to pay rates that are commensurate with the skills that are required for the work at hand. That could be another way to be protective against um, these trust violations. Um, our study also highlights that while nonprofits enjoy an enviable reputation for moral integrity, um, this can actually fuel high trust cultures, which then lead to complacency um, in internal controls and accountability practices. Um, so it can create that unquestioning environment that's ripe for exploitation. So we feel that this really reflects the dark side of trust. Um, and we talk in the paper about how we feel that this concept remains under theorized. Um, it's, it hasn't really received, I don't think, the empirical examination or development that it deserves. And a really practical takeaway here is the importance of balancing trust and control. Um, that's a really challenging balance to achieve, but it's really important for managing um, the trustworthiness of conduct. Now, more broadly, our work helps explain how institutional forces such as corporatization can unintentionally create conditions that facilitate untrustworthy behavior. So we feel that our results illustrate that while corporatization aims to enhance functional behavior through adopting those business-like approaches, greater transparency um, and reporting standards, paradoxically, when it's applied to mission-based organizations, it can actually produce dysfunctional um, behavior and conduct because it's, it can displace the mission of the organization. It become, can become misaligned. The focus of work can become misaligned with the primary purpose. So really here, the practical takeaways is ensuring um, that that mission and purpose is kept central to the everyday work of employees and volunteers and ensuring that performance and assess um, assessment metrics are being designed in a way that are balanced and are supportive of the mission rather than crowding it out. Now, look, there's lots of future research that I think um, our paper opens up here. Um, it is important to empirically examine the model that we've um, developed here, to examine those trickle-down pathways, um, to test their association with trust violations. And we talk about a range of different methodologies that we could see for doing that. Um, we also believe that it's important to test the generalizability and applicability of the model across different sectors and organizations. So while we focus specifically on the nonprofit sector, it is possible that our model may have wider applicability to other industries um, that share one of those sectoral features. For example, social enterprises and education that are mission oriented, um, small businesses and other um, industries where resources are scarce and constrained. So um, another strength of our study was tapping into the perspective of board members and senior executives that had that cross-sectorial and cross-organisational experience. Um, however, we're also aware that future research could explore the extent to which our model and those pathways align with the experience of employees um, working in nonprofits as well as regulators and other stakeholders. So we may be able to bring some more complementary insights there. And finally, um, you know, our our model and our findings pointed strongly to this trickle down uh, effect. So uh, a top down um, effects, but there could be two way or bottom up or even other additional cross level effects that may be possible. Um, and they could also be investigated. Okay, so in some then are features of the nonprofit sector um, are there features of the nonprofit sector that contribute to trust violations? Well, I think our um, study shows that yes, there are, um, and that these can these sectoral features can trickle down to influence that organizational and ethical infrastructure and in turn individual behavior and violations.
Okay, so moving on to some of the other questions that we explored, and I'm just going to give you the highlights here. We wanted to understand whether people respond differently to violations by nonprofits and commercial organisations. And here we were testing two competing hypotheses. What one we called the moral disillusionment hypothesis and the other the moral shield hypothesis. So the moral disillusionment hypothesis proposes that nonprofits will be penalised more harshly after an ethical transgression because the transgression violates expectations of how nonprofits should behave. So this aligns with expectancy violation theory as nonprofits have a stronger moral reputation than commercial organisations, they're held to higher expectations of ethical behaviour, resulting in greater disillusionment when they fail to live up to these expectations. So as such, we would expect that following a transgression, nonprofits will experience a greater decline in trust as well as consumer engagement than a commercial organisation. Now, in contrast, an alternative perspective is that the strong moral reputation of nonprofits may actually protect them in the event of a, of a transgression. So it may act as a trust bank that buffers them from the negative effects. So we call this the moral insurance hypothesis, and it really proposes that nonprofits would be penalised less harshly after a transgression because their moral reputation serves as a shield or as an insurance policy. And there's some support for this view. Um, work on corporate social responsibility and corporate reputation suggests, for example, that um, commercial organisations that invest in corporate social responsibility, that that can have insurance-like qualities, it can buffer those firms from backlash in the face of negative events. So according to this hypothesis, we would expect that following a transgression, a non-profit would see less of a decline in trust than a commercial organisation. So we tested this across three experiments, and in each experiment, we exposed participants to a different transgression and attributed it to either a commercial organisation or a non-profit. So these transgressions were actually adapted from real cases. Um, in the transgressions, um, the transgressions that we looked at included cases of fraud, unethical labour practices, and also exploitation of women, as shown in this example. So you might want to ask yourself, you know, after hearing that leaders at an organisation like Sony committed this transgression, how would it impact on you and um, your, how would it impact on your trust in that organisation? And then if it was committed by a charity like Oxfam, how might that change your trust in the organisation? So in each study, we measured trustworthiness um, of the organisation as well as consumer intentions to support the organisation. We did that both before and after reading about the transgression. And we also measured uh, expectancy violation, given that that was the key mechanism that was distinguishing our two hypotheses. Okay, so what did we find? Well, the three studies showed that prior to hearing about a transgression, nonprofits benefit from their moral reputations. So people trust the nonprofits more than the commercial organizations and also reported stronger consumer intentions. So to buy goods from the organization or to spread positive word of mouth about them. However, after hearing about the organization, after hearing the organization had engaged in a transgression, um, this led to a more dramatic drop in trust and consumer intentions in nonprofits than in the commercial organizations. So this really supported the moral disillusionment hypothesis. The decrease in trust and consumer intentions pre versus post transgression was particularly strong for the nonprofits relative to the commercial organizations that had committed the exact same ethical transgression. And our mediation analysis revealed that this occurred because the transgressions by the nonprofits violated expectations more than when the same transgression was committed by the commercial organization. So in contrast, the findings um, don't provide any support for the moral insurance hypothesis. So there was no evidence that the nonprofits were buffered from the negative effects of the transgression by virtue of their initial trust advantage. So here the answer is yes, transgressions do trigger more negative reactions from consumers when committed by nonprofits compared to commercial organisations. And why? Well, we found consistent support for that moral disillusionment hypothesis through that mechanism of expectancy violation. So there's some practical implications from this. Uh, for example, while nonprofits might enjoy trust benefits on their moral reputations, they also have more to lose from a trust breach than a commercial organisation. 
And I think it really helps nonprofit um, managers understand that a strong trust bank of good deeds, it's not sufficient to protect their organization from a loss of trust after a violation. So it's, I think it's particularly important for nonprofit boards and managers um, and employees to really work together to have in place that comprehensive range of governance and internal controls and cultural mechanisms to prevent breaches from occurring. Okay, so we subsequently replicated and extended this work um, by examining the question of whether after a scandal there are apologies whether apologies are received differently depending on whether they come from the nonprofits or the commercial organization. So again, we tested this using an experimental paradigm. Here we conducted two very similar methodologies to the last study that we just talked through. And here the answer really to this question is really no. We found trust and consumer support were partially restored following an apology. Um, we also found that there, that there was a restoration of trust even after a statement acknowledging that the scandal had occurred, even without apology. But what we found here is that the rate of repair was the same for nonprofits and commercial organisations. So despite nonprofits experiencing a steeper decline um, in trust, there is no recovery benefit. So past good deeds do not allow the nonprofits to recover more effectively from the scandal. So again, this really reinforces the importance of nonprofits preventing those violations. Now, a secondary um, question that we explored here, and this was actually replicated from the prior set of studies that I just described. And essentially um, what we were, what we found here is that um, the moral disillusionment um, following a transgression is stronger when the transgression directly subverts the stated mission of the nonprofit. So if the mission is to, of this nonprofit is to protect women, for example, and the transgression involves exploiting women, then we found that the trans, um, that, that the impact here was, was greater. The, the decline in trust and the difficulty recovering was greater. Okay, so we found that the nonprofit with a mission to protect women from sexual exploitation in particular, um, and hence the transgression was directly mission relevant, um, so they experienced the, the sharpest declines in trust. So overall, the results don't paint a very happy picture for nonprofits that find themselves embroiled in some sort of a scandal. Nonprofits will be punished more harshly than commercial organisations for ethical missteps um, and will not have an easier time repairing damaged trust. At the same time, we do find that trust can be repaired to some extent when organisations either directly apologise or even just acknowledge the violation without taking responsibility. However, the nonprofits cannot easily win back that initial trust advantage that they had over commercial organisations once they've lost it. Okay, so our fourth question then. We really wanted to explore here whether there is a global crisis of trust in nonprofits. And this was motivated by a really strong media narrative of a crisis of trust in nonprofits and charities. Um, there was indications that trust levels had significantly declined to all time lows. You can see here just some of these different media articles. So we asked Edelman, um, who run the Edelman Trust Barometer, if they would be willing to share their data on non-government organisations across time. They agreed, which enabled us to examine change in trust over a nine-year period um, across 31 countries. So our multi-level analyses here revealed that after allowing for differences in absolute trust levels, as well as trends across countries, there was actually a small increase in global trust in the nonprofit sector. So um, we acknowledge here that the study, while it's strong in terms of representativeness in sample size and time periods, one of the weaknesses is that there we had a limitation in terms of using a single item indicator of trust, which is what the Edelman Trust Barometer relies on. So we did find some various patterns in terms of individual countries, but actually we found that more countries actually increased in trust than decreased. We found that actually only um, three studies over this period showed any decrease um, in trust over time. And we also found that, uh, that essentially trust, um, the decline in trust 
it really didn't play, um, there wasn't really a lot of variation at all. So it was less than 1% of the variance. So overall, we find no evidence of a crisis of trust in nonprofits. Um, scandals within individual organisations don't seem to have affected um, that trust at that sectorial level. Rather, the data suggests that actually trust has remained quite stable in the sector over the time that we examined it. Okay, so moving on then to the last question. Um, trust is assumed to be important for trust for charitable giving, um, but we did notice in the literature that there's mixed associations that have been found. Um, there's also been some recent theoretical approaches which have emphasised motives for giving um, that do not rely on trust. So to resolve this sort of tension of how much does trust really matter for charitable giving, we conducted a meta-analysis. Um, we found 42 studies and 69 effect sizes that we could um, draw on to conduct the meta-analysis. Um, overarching, this was involving over 81,000 people in 31 countries, so a very large um, sample here. And essentially what um, the findings confirmed was there is a positive association between trust and giving. We found this across diverse measures. But what we found was that um, it was trust in organisations, so in specific charities, as well as trust in the sector that were more strongly associated with giving. So the overarching sort of effects um, R sizes here were ranged between 0.7 and 0.35. So in contrast, um, generalised trust and trust in institutions in general had weaker effects. Um, they were all under 0.2. So in terms of the conclusion here, um, there are a couple of caveats. Um, all the evidence that we reviewed here in our meta-analysis, all of those studies were correlational and very few studies measured actual giving behaviour. Um, rather, most of them were relying on measures of intentions to give or um, past giving behaviour. Okay, so overall across this program of research, what do we find evidence for? Well, we find evidence that sectoral features do matter. We find evidence that um, charities are punished more for a trust breach than commercial organisations. We find that trust can be recovered and apologies certainly help, um, potentially you know, in the short term recovering about half of trust loss, but we don't find that nonprofits or charities have any particular trust advantage in terms of recovering trust. We also find that trust matters. So there's a moderate relationship between trust, um, particularly in specific organizations or nonprofits and the sector um, with giving behavior. And we also debunk the myth that this that there, there is a crisis of trust you know, globally in terms of declining levels of trust in nonprofits. We don't find any evidence for that from the data that we had. So if anyone would like to um, delve into more um, on the, these findings, um, all of these are now published. Um, as I said, the final paper in this series was published just earlier this year. And I think maybe at this point, I'll open it up for questions and discussion and then can talk a little bit about um, one of the upcoming um, conferences and theme, uh, sub-themes at the EGOS conference that um, some people might be interested in joining.